Hi guys, my name is Anuj Jindal and today we are going to talk about something very important and that is English for uh, phase 2 of RBI examination. Now NABAD, NABAD uh, notification is also out. So English uh, holds equal importance for both RBI and the upcoming NABAD examination and therefore I have started discussing the answers of all the tests that I have been providing to enrolled students. Okay? So what we are going to do today is discuss test 1. Now these topics are going to be very important for both NABARD as well as the upcoming RBI examination and of course down the line SEBI examination also. So let us start discussing uh, the English papers for uh, uh, NABARD as well as RBI examination. So as you can see on the screen now you can see uh, the English test paper 1. Uh, there were three essay topics that I had given. There was one Pressy and uh, there was uh, one comprehension. Now this is the English test 1 and the first essay topic that I am going to discuss about is what are the reasons behind high unemployment rate in India coupled with reducing labor force participation rate. So the first thing that you do when you start reading a particular essay topic is identify the keywords. Reasons behind high unemployment rate in India. This is your first keyword. Number one, high unemployment rate. Number two, India. So we are specifically going to talk about India and that is very important in any essay topic that you uh, start with. Coupled with reducing labor force participation rate. So the unemployment rate is increasing or high whereas the labor force participation rate is reducing that is going low. So this is something that is very important. Uh, because both of them are going into opposite directions and that is why understanding it and then answering it holds a lot of importance. Now, now this is one introduction that I received from one of the students who wrote the essay uh, and so I thought let us put it here so that uh, if you are practicing or analyzing uh, your own performance uh, tomorrow then you can pr uh, probably go through a good introduction. Now why I liked this particular introduction is I will tell you despite high GDP growth for the past for the last few years the unemployment rate in India stands 45 year high at 6.1 percent as per NSSO's periodic labor force survey. The LFPR the proportion of population working or seeking job declined to this. So it is uh, proving that the statement that have been provided here that is unemployment rate is going up and LFPR is going down has been proven in this introduction and that is why I like this particular introduction short, crisp, very sweet and solves the purpose. Now what are the other introductions that you could have written if you were to write this particular uh, a test on this topic. There are two things that hold a lot of importance whenever you are writing anything. Number one important thing is you have to or you should be defining uh, the terms that have been mentioned, the keywords that you have identified. So if you do that, that is good, that is one of the way. So defining what is unemployment, defining what is labor force participation rate, that is one part of the introduction. And the second part is importance of the keywords, importance of the entire topic in fact. So why is it important that, that unemployment is going up and at the same time LFPR has been going down for quite some time. So that importance needs to be specified, needs to be mentioned in the introduction itself so that the flow or the connection between introduction and the body paragraph is created. As soon as you write the importance, the connection between first and second paragraph automatically appears and that is why it becomes a lot more important. Now what about the body paragraph? What exactly uh, should you be writing in the body paragraph? Let us go through that. Number one, we are going to talk about the reasons for high, uh, for sorry, low LFPR. The reasons for low LFPR, labor force participation rate. Number one reason, and here the most important part is, or most important point is, uh, keeping in mind multidimensionality. You have to talk about the same thing from different points of view. Okay, just look at yourself. Let's say this is angle zero. So you have to look around yourself and see what are the different dimensions you can find. Number one, education. If people are enrolling in educational institutions more, specifically in higher educational institutions, that means automatically the LFPR is going to go down. 
that is people instead of looking for jobs will start enrolling in schools and colleges and therefore their uh, desire to work or their being included in the LFPR will go down. The reason behind declining LFPR, especially among women, is increased enrollment for higher education, which allows them to pursue leisure and other non-work activities, reducing female labor force participation. So this is one of the reasons. This is not the only reason. And this is specifically related with, more related with female labor force participation than male labor force participation. Number two, increase in household income. So when the household income goes up, then men allow their women to withdraw from work which is completely a chauvinistic attitude but it happens in the country and yes that i told you we are to specifically talk about india and not about the global scenario and therefore we can easily and comfortably say that it has been observed and proved through various statistics that men or families which get into middle income group or from middle to higher income group decide to withdraw women from work whether it's forceful, whether it's uh, voluntary, it happens. Regular jobs are unavailable. Another driver of their withdrawal from labor force is insufficient availability of a regular part-time job that provides steady income and allows women to reconcile household duties with work. So this is another reason that uh, people are withdrawing from work or they are not able to become a part of LFPR because regular income generating employment opportunities are not available. Demographics, number four, high percentage of population in primary and higher educational institutions. But uh, this can be or cannot be a reason of reducing LFPR. Because if yesterday there were 10 million people in the age group of 18 to 65, uh, then today also there would be 10 or more than 10. It will, it will reduce or increase after a significant point of time, probably one decade or two decades. Okay, So that particular point is uh, controversial. Uh, then you, we come to the reasons for high unemployment rate. High unemployment. What are the reasons that unemployment rate has been increasing and has increased by leaps and bounds in the past uh, four to five years? Number one is policy paralysis. Employment policies of the government uh, majority population is still employed in agriculture due to unavailability of organized jobs in manufacturing services. So what happens is majority of the people, almost 50% of the population is still employed in agriculture. The reason is even if they want to move towards manufacturing and services, there are no jobs or minimum jobs, minimal jobs. And secondly, they don't have the skill sets. So the government has not worked upon teaching them those skill sets so that they can move and be productive contributors in manufacturing or in the services sector. So this is completely a policy reason. The second reason is global slowdown. Less exports of the country mean less employment opportunities. So directly connected. And this is what uh, you know Trump has also been saying that we want to put tariffs on China because we believe that if we start exporting more and or start importing less either we start exporting more or we start importing less in any scenario the employment opportunities in the country should increase of course there are other dimensions and other arguments which counter these arguments but at the same time this is one argument which is valid third is skills or educational so what happens if you don't have the skill set the right skill set which is required by the industry you must have you're all uh, graduates, you must have experienced it while you were about to pass out from colleges. A lot of companies would come in and they would be like, okay, uh, you guys are good, but we will have to train you according to the requirements of our company. And the same happens everywhere. Why? Because whatever we are being taught is too either too theoretical or is not in line with what the industry or what these companies demand. For example, let's say uh, tomorrow I start hiring some people for teaching then I need people who are uh, comfortable with computers, com comfortable with Excel, comfortable with Word, comfortable with PowerPoints. But, and also at the same time, they should have decent communication skills. But uh, these basic skill sets are also not available among graduates or even among masters. So it is always very shocking to see that these basic tenets, these basic skill sets are not being taught to graduates or to master students, which is a big 
gap between what the industry or what the entire ecosystem of employment demands and what is being taught in the country okay so third is major point then you have demographics high percentage of population in primary and higher educational institutions so this is certainly more of a point related with unemployment rather than uh, with lfpr and cultural desire for white collar jobs people have a desire for white collar jobs instead of blue collar jobs and that is why they uh, uh, either stop looking for employment or they keep they are looking for employment but at the same time they are not willing to uh, get into blue collar jobs so they stay unemployed okay so these are the major reasons which have been provided and there are two three more reasons number one cash crunch faced by msme sectors post demonetization so this is a specific reason uh, which also brings out the importance of cash in the system uh, although people say that it is directly or purely connected with black money but it is not true sometimes cash is good and some amount of cash is good for the system so especially for the people who are belonging to lower or lower middle class uh, and either running msme sector msme enterprises or working in those enterprises they are completely reliant on cash so those kinds of people were affected those kinds of companies and those kinds of employees were directly affected post demonetization and they have not been able to overcome this issue and again gst also had a big uh, shock uh, especially for the msme and small enterprises okay unorganized versus unorganized employment so what is happening in india as uh, the prime minister has also uh, agreed or put it in a positive mode is that entrepreneurs are rising uh, a, a person who is you know uh, making uh, let's say pakoras or samosas on the street should also be counted as employed as a part of gdp so that is an un unorganized employment on the other hand organized employment is something which provides you social security which provides you permanence which provides you a specific time frame of work so that your quality of life improves now those things are unavailable in our system to a large extent uh, barring the manufacturing and the services sector and that is what affects or has increased unemployment in the country lack of public and private sector jobs this is certainly uh, a big issue in the elections also and therefore have it has a direct impact on un unemployment rate in the country uh, now i would like to name this uh, particular girl siddhu vishaka she wrote a very good essay on unemployment and i thought i will announce the name so that tomorrow you can get in touch with her in the uh, enrolled students uh, telegram group and she can probably share her essay if she wants to okay let's come to the pressy now then we'll come to the next essay uh, so in the pressy uh, this is specifically going to be more important for the enrolled students because they've already given test 1 so the broad structure what you have to do when you start with a pressy is before writing it you have to create such broad structure specifically pointers these pointers give you a direction a structure to the essay and at the same time they also tell you what's important and what's not important okay so the s the pressy was about national e-commerce policy uh, which is a draft policy right now under discussion and uh, you had to write uh, a pressy of about 100 words on necp so the first uh, point that i wanted to mention uh, when i read that particular board, uh, particular paragraph was the purpose of necp because it's a draft policy and it is uh, completely futuristic at the same time i have a lot of uh, critics and therefore it's very important to spell out the purpose of any any cp so that whatever any person who is reading about reading, reading that particular pressy is clear okay this is the purpose of the new e-commerce policy then what are the specific provisions if you tell the provisions first and then tell, tell the purpose it's going to defeat the entire purpose or defeat the objective uh, of that particular pressy similarly for example if i have given you monthly current affairs i don't tell you uh, you know tell me so the current affairs every topic is divided into three parts what why and tell me more i don't tell you tell me more first and then move to what and why i tell you what is this topic about why is this topic important 
or the purpose of this particular issue and then I move towards tell me more where I talk about the specific provisions. The same goes for this, you talk about purpose of any CP, then you talk about definition of certain important things that you are going to mention in NAC, NECP which is data and then you talk about provisions or visions mentioned in NECP, what is the importance of data, so definition has already been given here, then you talk about importance of data and then you finally talk about rule on imports which was specified twice in the uh, draft policy therefore it was important. So this was the PRESI, uh, although I have shared this structure with a lot of students who did not write their PRESI well because it was the first one but I thought that I will share it here also. Okay, This is one uh, good essay on globalization 4 which was written by a student. I have uh, not name, mentioned the name but the entire essay has been posted here so you can read it, I will be sharing the PDF also. What exactly is globalization 4 and in India? So the topic is globalization 4 and in India, number one you need to define what is globalization 4, what is the connection with India and in the body paragraph you will start talking about uh, the specific features of globalization 4 and their connection with India. Okay. So the first such feature is digitally enabled services. Globalization 4 is all about uh, providing every service in the digital format, okay. whether it is education, whether it is healthcare, whether it is uh, uh, you know working job opportunities, uh, whether it is moving around your house, everything is going to be connected to the digital world. So digitally enabled services is one major uh, feature of globalization 4.0. How is it connected with India? We having a large population, one of the largest populations in the world are going to be benefited by digitalization of the services because then the reach of the government to the masses will increase by, spell, uh, increase by great margins. For example, today uh, if the government wants to reach out to the farmers, it uses USSD or messages which are being sent. If the farmers want to reach out to banks or to the government, they use certain uh, messages under Kisan credit card system and there are a lot of other methods also wherein the farmers can directly contact uh, for their help. So that is one format of how digital uh, digital enabling of everything can help people connect with each other better. So this is one such example. Second is global public private cooperation. So public private cooperation increases with digitization. Of course public private partnership contracts and all these things you must have heard about them in the sector of infrastructure. But imagine that everything that we do, let us say providing of education services. In the government schools you have uh, private enterprises or let us say you have NGOs come in and use digital technologies to provide better education in those government schools. How fantastic can that be? The quality will increase, improve at the same time uh, uh, government schools are providing free education so education will also improve or increase that will have a positive ripple effect on employment levels, on skill levels of those people, of those students. Therefore, global public private cooperation uh, through digitization can start a new wave of how public private partnerships work. The third one is globally shared purpose. So right now because the world is connected although it is connected digitally but not to direct extent, so we have national tendencies like protectionism of the US or polarization happening in India wherein the tendency is not national rather it is based on certain religion or region or caste. So that purpose can be actually defeated if you have digital services or digital technology spread everywhere. Okay? Uh, so that of course looks very virtual at the time being and very uh, unrealistic but that is how you can connect with people of another nation to such an extent that a shared purpose is created rather than a, a national or a limited purpose. Okay? For example, environment. Lot of people are talking about environment and climate change, the disasters which are increasing day by day. How can you connect with people across the globe and try and create a new strategy when it comes to environment? Of course, you can do it only when digitization increases. 
new model of education i have given the examples of education quite a lot reducing inequalities and insecurities so let's take an example to connect it to banking uh, let's say there's a high inequality in the system the government or the banking system or the rbi has already identified it and the government decides okay let's try and reduce inequality in the system so let's start by targeting people who are very rich but at the same time not paying that amount of taxes if digitization increases in the system that becomes possible and that becomes easier so that will be the first second is let's uh, let's start identif identifying people who are very poor and let's start helping these poor people through one of the more productive activities okay productive schemes or uh, whatever the government decides to do so this way inequalities or insecurities of course insecurities right now are increasing through digitization but it can also be used positively wherein a positive environment can be created hindus muslims or any other religion or region or caste based insecurities can be reduced through digitization okay so these are the positive effects of digitization of sorry globalization 4 or the features of globalization 4 and how india is connected to them okay the next topic that we have is what steps can the government take to reduce fiscal and revenue deficit these are the keywords while ensuring enough investment for development and growth so what steps the government can take not the rbi not any other uh, uh, you know institution but what steps can the government take to reduce both fiscal and revenue deficit we have to talk about both fiscal and revenue deficit and at the same time you also have to ensure enough investment for development and growth so these are the pointers that have been provided by me number one self reliance in goods presently imported reduce revenue deficit so if you want to reduce revenue deficit the first point is you have to reduce your imports necessary imports necessary imports and how do you reduce your necessary imports by creating the same things on your own for example you import a lot of oil but you actually don't need that much oil because the alternative best alternative is solar energy but surprisingly a country like india has not been able to utilize that and in fact majority of our solar panels are being imported from china if we had a policy and the political will to replace or to supplement solar energy as an alternative to oil successful alternative to oil we could have created it so self reliance on goods presently imported is important if you want to reduce your revenue deficits in the future increase tax base by simplifying tax laws and encouraging people to file taxes again you reduce revenue deficit by increasing the tax collection and this does not have to be coercive in nature as is presently happening this can also be voluntary in nature if the tax policies are accepted by the people reduce irrational subsidies from the system to reduce revenue deficit adoption of dbt in subsidy so, so that irrational subsidies can be removed from the system and only rational and more targeted subsidies can be provided this i think is self explanatory not much required encourage mg narega like schemes which integrate subsidy with investment in capital goods so this is very important what i have mentioned here is at one point of time or at one uh in one dimension you are trying to reduce your uh subsidy uh, uh burden on unproductive things and whatever subsidies you are providing you are ensuring that it also results in an increase or has a positive impact on investment in capital goods so mg narega is one such policy so encouraging or creating more such policies whether in health whether in education whether in roads in anything and everything that's around us so that while you are subsidizing you are also ensuring that that subsidy contributes towards investment and uh, uh, you know more production of capital goods focusing on structural changes in the economy to boost new entrepreneurs at the ground level because what will it do it will increase exports and domestic demand in the economy domestic demand in the economy okay more production in the economy resulting in more growth and more investment these new entrepreneurs are not going to sit idle they are going to invest a lot of uh, uh, a lot in the economy by either creating something or buying something from other organizations and then creating something else so they are contributing in the entire gdp investment uh, scenario of the economy so that is how structural changes can impact raising investments from private sector for public purposes 
more investment for development so what you can do is you can directly raise investments from the private sector rather than rather than borrowing those investments borrowing that money uh, because borrowing increases the fiscal deficit or looking for grants because that is unproductive in nature so it's more productive to raise investments from the private sector a very good example or very important thing that the government has still not done is private investments in the agriculture sector although some companies have started doing it but it's not at a mass scale we need to uh, we need to promote evergreen revolution and at the same time invite the private sector to create small small enterprises which are very efficient very productive and also earn a lot for their uh, household incomes so that the private sector can also be a part of agriculture so that's important crowdfunding for various public purposes rather than borrowing so this is again going to reduce fiscal deficit outsourcing various government activities to non profit organizations while maintaining the core purpose and quality of those services so what will it do it will reduce the pressure of government uh, on carrying out activity activities which are not productive for example air india that probably is the best example you can uh, you know leave it to the private sector you don't need uh, 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 an airline company which is uh, going into heavy losses or already in heavy losses because of mismanagement you don't need to keep running it is running it you can put the money elsewhere for more productive purposes okay so outsourcing various government activities to non profit organizations MOUs with foreign governments to invest in infrastructure in India, thereby reducing fiscal deficit, and more professional public sector enterprises, public sector units, so that their profits can reduce the fiscal deficit or the revenue deficit in the country. So these are all the points which are uh, multi-dimensional in nature, trying to connect every point and also trying to cover both fiscal deficit and revenue deficit at the same time. Okay, so this was about English test one. I hope you liked it. Next we'll be discussing English test 2 very shortly.